right now on Higher Journeys Radio with Alexis Brooks. What is mental illness and where does it come from? Is it a psychological state of being inherited through genetics? Is it a condition that emerges after a severe traumatic experience? Or is it a psychic virus cast upon unsuspecting individuals from the hidden realm? These are all complex questions, but the answers share one common theme, that of multidimensionality. In this, a follow-up to our recent discussion about the metaphysics of mental illness, I bring in two well-researched individuals to try and tackle this very big subject. Jay Widener, an authority on hermetic and alchemical traditions, and Paul Levy, consciousness researcher and author of the landmark book, Dispelling Watiko, Breaking the Curse of Evil. Needless to say, this conversation was riveting and revelational. And after you listen in, you may never look at mental illness the same way again. Jay and Paul, just last week, I was initially putting together our recent show on the metaphysics of mental illness, which is our conscious commentary episode that aired just last week. And in doing so, I had a stream of consciousness, almost like a voice that said, if you want two people that can share immeasurable insight on this angle of mental illness, it's Jay Widener and Paul Levy. Get them on now. <laughs> this is really what came through. And the impulse was so strong, guys, I knew I had to do just that and in a hurry. So I can't tell you how delighted I am that the stars were aligned. You both were available at my requested date and time and willing to come on together. So first off, I just want to thank you ever so much for accepting my invitation to join us on this journey, which I know our audience is going to love. So welcome to you both. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Well, last week on our Conscious Commentary episode that covered this idea of mental illness from a more esoteric perspective, I proposed two very important ideas or possible entry points to the discussion about mental illness and moreover its pervasiveness. And I know this is a complex, multidimensional and mysterious phenomenon, but here's what I was able to sort of focus the discussion on last week. First, we looked at an alchemical perspective. We looked at mental illness and trauma in all of its myriad forms as a form of initiation into higher consciousness or a means by which to learn uh, the art and science of transmutation. But second, uh, of which I spent less time on but thought was apropos to bring into the discussion, was the archonic influence. So the question is, is humanity being infected with illness of all kinds, including mental illness, by this elusive non-human contingent that is said to be living side by side with us? that uh, that which emerges from the unseen. So if it's fair enough, these are the two areas I'd like to go into with both of you. But I want to start out with a, a, what will be considered a basic question, but I know you're not going to have a basic answer for it. Um, I would like each of you <laughs> to define mental illness from your understanding, either one, whoever wants to go first. What is mental yeah. illness? Yeah, I'm happy to go first because I was, you know, 35 years old. I was diagnosed as being mentally ill, and and I thought that people who were diagnosing me were, were just were just stupid. Um, but that's a whole other story. But um, you know, I guess the thing I want to say is it's, it's a really questionable concept that there is something called mental illness. Um, you know, people they'll they'll use the term as if it's an actual objective thing with actual biological, psychological sort of I don't know these markers or something. And it's just a twilight concept. And um, so I'm just putting that out because we're talking about it as if it's a real thing. And clearly there's behavior that's out of balance. But I just want to actually start the conversation by saying that, I guess. Mm, interesting. And I know that, uh, Paul, of course, you were on our show. I, I'm trying to, it seemed like it was last year. It may have been two years now where you've been very open about the fact that you you feel that you've gone through some aspect of this. And, of course, we're going to talk about your book, Dispelling Watiko, and how you were just so lucid in sort of bringing together from your own experience, uh, your understanding from a very complex but brilliant perspective. Uh, Jay, what about you? And, by the way, I'm getting a lot of feedback on you. And what are you doing over there in Boulder? <laughs> 
What, what am I doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm having just, fun. Yeah, I can tell. There's a lot of, a lot of. I'm just, I'm gonna have you just kind of back off the phone a little bit because I'm getting a lot of. I'm even hearing your breathing. I think so. <laughs> All right. Go for it. What's mental illness to you, Jay Widener? Well, I mean, I sort of tend to agree with Paul. I, I, I'm, I'm sure that, I'm sure growing up in the '60s, um, that I was considered by many that surrounded me as possibly being mentally ill because I had ideas that nobody else had, mm-hmm. and I was thinking of concepts that no one else was thinking of, and people thought I was crazy. In fact, my nickname was Jay Weirdner. Oh, and um, <laughs> so I don't know, you know, and, and, and then I look at them and at the people that surrounded me when I was growing up, and I thought they were crazy. I thought that they were crazy. They didn't want to travel. They didn't want to mm. try out new things. They were kind of boring. They didn't like different foods or music or cultures. And I thought that they were crazy. So I don't know. I know there is crazy. I've known schizophrenics. Uh, I know there is a mental illness. There is something that can go wrong with people mentally, and they need desperate help. And I think that we're having, because we are... Um, moving further and further away from spiritual traditions, whatever you think of spiritual traditions isn't important. What is important is that they do maintain a certain coherency and it, within the culture and the community. And I think as we move away from, from spiritual traditions, we're going to have more and more people uh, have a distended personality and they're not going to have a a tribe or a community or a group that they can belong to and that's going to contribute even more to this mental alienation Mm. that is running rampant right now and paul talks about it in the wetico as it being almost like a disease or something disease of the mind absolutely right what did you just say mental what did you you just said something perfect uh, apropos mental what did you just say? Uh, Mental, um, Paul, what did he just say? It was perfect. I was going to write it down to, to really just sum it up. Anyway, oh, we'll, we'll come back to that. But listen, speaking of, um, we're going to stay with you, Jay, for a minute. I, I found this article that you penned, I think, back in 2016 called Prophecy, Spirit, and Dream Time, The Last Frontier. And I found a quote that I think is perfect to where I'd like to take this conversation. So I want to quote you. You said, quote, the essential teaching from the tradition of the Australian Aborigines is that everything in our world begins in the dream time. From their ancient perspective, every thought, every action emerges from a larger metaphysical landscape that surrounds and pervades our material world. They call this larger reality the dream time. According to this tradition, each living thing first begins in the dream time. After it has become fully developed in the dream time, it then concretizes and becomes a part of our three-dimensional reality, end quote. So my question is, this struck me because I think it is apropos for our conversation. Could it be that on some level, we are dreaming, some level, I want to say, we're dreaming up this plight of mental illness, among other things? In other words, do we have skin in this game on a really deep level? We d- well, we do. And, you know, this is the, the thing is that, Mental illness is on the rise, yet we are doing better than ever as a people, as a species. We have, you know, central heat, hot and cold, running water. We have the entire uh, world of knowledge at at our fingertip. Um, We've really never had it so good. And makes you wonder why we're all so unhappy. Because we have, as far as physical needs... There really isn't much poverty in the United States anymore. There is, but not much. So I wonder where this is all coming from. Mm. And I have to say that there is an external force at work here that we cannot deny. This force is a physical force. It's real. And it likes to mess with us. And so we also have to deal with that. The thing is, is that our spiritual traditions taught us about these negative forces and how to deal with them. Now we're all, we've all been cut loose and we're drifting in the, in the, in the uh, landscape of, of, of our consciousness and we're blind. And so these negative forces which surround us, 
see that we're blind and they see that we don't see them and notice them and they mm. take advantage of us too. So mm. there's many aspects to what's going on. The Aborigines definitely believe that there are negative spiritual energies that you have to be very careful about, not letting them into your tribe, not letting them into your uh, family or your friends, and they keep a watch on it. In fact, that's what the shaman's main job was, was to make sure that this disorder doesn't come into the tribe. And it's a disorder that starts out with like just innocent like gossip, but soon turns into full-out anger and violence if it's mm. not curtailed. And we do not have those mechanisms in our society yeah. to, to curtail these uh, forces. Here, here. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I can I can hear Paul thinking, because I'm going to go to him next on this, because I think we're this is a perfect segue to get into dispelling Watiko, Paul. Uh, thanks for that, Jay. Let, let's talk yeah. about that, because I know you got a lot to say about this. How First, I think it would be great if, uh, now I, I'm hoping that everybody Everybody in the Higher Journeys audience has heard our, our great interview that we did a couple of years ago. If not, I'll make sure to link it. But for those that haven't, if you could just give us sort of a, a thumbnail of what Watiko is, and then how does it play into this conversation right now? Sure. Well, um, the, 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 um, the phrase Watiko, it's a Native American phrase, which connotes really this this disease of the mind, this this cannibalistic spirit, which is really the source of all of the evil that our species plays out, you know, with each other and, and in ourselves. Um, and so it's a psychospiritual disease of the soul whose origin is the human psyche. Hmm. Okay, and, but I point out in my book that it's such an interesting phenomena because the, or the source of it is the human psyche, but somehow it's able to extend itself into the world and in a synchronistic way configure events in the outer world so as to actually express itself. And, um, and so that's actually pointing at that what's actually playing out in the world is in some way symbolically reflecting this disease of the soul. Hmm. And w when you begin to see that is when you begin to, to awaken to the dreamlike nature of reality, wh which is the solution and the cure for what Tico and this other thing about Watiko is that it's a blindness, it's a psychic blindness, and it's a particular type of psychic blindness where we actually um, think we're not only sighted, but we think that we see more clearly than the people who are seeing clearly. Hmm. And so it works through the projected tendencies of the mind in such a way that we project onto the inkblot of the waking dream in such a way that we become entranced by our projections thinking they exist objectively separate from ourselves, and we then react to the projections as if they're objective, and we become programmed via that process. And the, I guess one other thing about Watiko that's so amazing is that encoded in this, this sort of evil spirit, whose origin is, you know, our psyche, is its own medicine. So mm -hmm. it's pure, is, is like, enfolded within the pathology and it's not just the cure but it's actually it actually is giving us a gift that it's actually helping us to to wake up to the dreamlike nature mm -hmm. this is really something i'm just seeing all of these again cross correlations uh, and of course i i uh, you and i paul have talked about how i see the way you've uh, so eloquently described watiko as being mm -hmm. sort of a homeopathic approach uh, to to healing, you know, the, the cure yeah. is in the virus itself. But the rub yeah. is that it seems that the majority, if not all of the population are oblivious to these dynamics. And that in and of itself make could it be Jay an arconic configuration to keep us so blind from what to some of us is so obvious? Um, well, it is curious, I have to say. Um, how people can remain so oblivious to what's going on around them. And um, they do create these false constructs, which I find incredibly fascinating. And then they live as if the false constructs are real. And uh, this is spreading now uh, to ridiculous degrees via uh, the media and the Internet, um, to which we're now to the point where we don't know what's real anymore mm -hmm. and what isn't. And so I think that in, in a lot of ways that's a good thing because that means we have to rely more and more on our own ability to discern reality and um, what is real and what isn't. And as this mental illness 
increases and pervades our society, uh, it becomes more and more difficult for us to communicate with each other, which is what's happening now. Um, people are in their own bubbles and mm-hmm. they can't get out. I think that in the end, it's all going to um, fall apart. And, 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 and when it falls apart, we're going to be better for this experience. Mm. That's, I'm writing that one down. In the end, it's all going to fall apart. I have that sense too, guys. I don't know how you feel, Paul, but I think there are a lot of us that sense, you know, we've heard this now cliched term, we're in a shift, but we are. And I I just talked uh, with Linda Moulton Howe out in uh, California about this arc of, uh, you know, we keep saying we're on a precipice, we're at a crescendo, uh, but it is an arc. It takes a bit of time, but perhaps it has to get so drastic so that it falls apart so we can build a new it's yeah, complex. Well, yeah. Right. Well, no, I, I, I fully agree in the sense that, you know, our current way of life is unsustainable. And but it's really, you know, just um, invoking quantum physics for a, a moment. The future is really it's, you know, it's not it's not definitive one way or the other. It's very probabilistic. We could be destroying, you know, the biosphere and then, you know, our species Or we could be waking up because Mm. the thing about darkness, the darkness that's playing out in our world, you know, it's very scary and 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 just horrible in a certain way. And yet when there's intense darkness, it's also an expression that light is nearby. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of, um, you know, the whole idea of Watiko, it's a quantum phenomenon that superposed in Watiko it can either destroy us, it's the incredible poison, it's evil that could take us down, or it could wake us up, and how it manifests, similar to like how light manifests as a wave or a particle, it depends how do we dream it. Absolutely. I agree with you. I always say that everything that we we call a part of our reality, the things that we're faced with included, are really neutral, and that it, it's up to us as to how we want to utilize it. So maybe this is a good segue. I want to talk, we're kind of traversing two perspectives, and yet I think they're connected. We're talking about, I'd like to talk about the alchemical perspective, as well as the archonic. Uh, so let's bring in the alchemical for a minute. And, and, and Jay, both of you I know can speak to this, but Jay, you're, that's synonymous with a lot of the work that you've done. I think there's something quite fascinating, but complex going on. When you look at mental illness and all suffering, for that matter, from an alchemical perspective, I I recently did a two part uh, interview with, uh, I think you both know, Neil Kramer, spiritual philosopher, uh, in which we covered mapping the shadow aspects of ourselves and confronting the shadow head on, almost as a form of initiation into a more evolved conscious state. Now, I know this has hallmarks of alchemical teaching. Jay, why don't you give me your thoughts first from that perspective? Well, <clears throat> you know, the thing is in alchemy is that the alchemist is is trying to achieve a state. But <clears throat> once he achieves that state, then he can actually start doing the work. So you have to achieve the state first before you start doing the work. So what is that state? Well, that state is like a, a, a pure state, a, a state of, uh, I guess, what you say, of no mental illness, no mental breakdowns, complete um, a rational approach to the world around you. And, and then what you do in alchemy is you'll take a mineral or a plant and you will break it down. You will um, break it down into small pieces, you will liquefy it, and then you will dry it up and then you have a, uh, make a tincture out of the dried uh, 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 dried up parts of it. You then make a tincture, and then you take that tincture. So what is all this about? Well, you have to do it, and what you're doing is you're infusing your spirit into the mineral or to the plant. Mm-hmm. And uh, because you've already achieved this high level of state, the infusion process is a high pure process. So what you're doing is you're creating a homeopathic feedback right. loop, and, um, and 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 so today, so so kings would kill the alchemists trying to get the alchemical formula that would make them live a long time. But what they didn't understand is that they're not qualified for it anyway. So you can kill all the alchemists you want; you're never going to get the. Uh, the secret because you're, of your own nature is is evil and 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 bad, so it won't do you any good anyway. Mm-hmm. So the whole thing is 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 that we you know the Buddha 
the Buddha of the Buddha had his revelation under the Bodhi tree, mm -hmm. and when he had his revelation, he was thinking about all the things that we're talking about right now, and he wanted to know why there was so much suffering, and why it seemed to be increasing, and what he could do about it. What what could he do to ease the suffering of humans? And his answer was, sit and be quiet. Mm -hmm. Don't think about it. You know, because if you think about it, you're contributing to it. So mm. don't contribute to it. To try to go into a state of no mind where you're no longer contributing to the wetico, really, and um, you can't you can't stop it, but you can all but you can not contribute to it. And that was his final solution. And I think the Buddha was a genius. And I think that is the solution to how we can travail through this process of of our life right now in this crazy culture that we're living in. Interesting. I love that. And as soon as you mentioned the Buddha, of course, we're, in, we're familiar with that story, that, 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 that state of contemplation. That I think hopefully more of us are finding ourselves in because I think there's no other choice really but to, as Russell Simmons once said when asked, uh, how do you meditate, Mr. Simmons? He says, sit your ass down and be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> Don't make it more complicated. And the more you focus on that which you were trying to avoid, the more you bring it on. I hear alchemy, homeopathy, Watiko, all of these are perennial philosophies, frankly, and they're all connected. Yes? At some level. Well, yeah, one, I want to say one more thing then, yeah. because I think this is really important. See, we never had the internet before. Okay, and the internet is doing something which I think has gone largely unnoticed by most people. And what it's doing, I, I call it the rebellion of the intelligent. What the internet has done is it has created uh, different cultures. And one of the cultures that has been created by the internet is a culture where all the high IQ, really um, expanded consciousness people go to certain sites and we share our stories and we, sh we, sh we read other people's stories. And what we're doing is we're maturing. The human race is maturing. And the Internet is the device that's making us mature. We're, look we're now able to look out at the world and see the evil for what it really is, not our fantasy of what evil is, but the real evil and what they're really doing. And it's kind of a no-holds-barred environment right now where we're waking up so fast it's almost nauseating. And, uh, and the leading edge is like saying to, you know, to each other, I've had enough. We're done with this. Mm -hmm. we're not gonna, we're, we, can't, we can't live this world anymore. It's like we're watching a world run by 12-year-olds, mm -hmm. and we can't have that world anymore. We now have to come on, out as uh, mature people and, and take the world by storm and, and make it what, you know, what we want. And instead of having the culture drive us, we need to start driving the culture now. Mm-hmm. I agree with you, and, and I'm going to bring Paul uh, back into this, but I, I just want to say that, I, as I've said so many times, whatever it is, I think I just said it earlier, whatever it is that we're talking about, internet, fire, water, <laughs> the elements, fire can cook your food or burn you, water can quench your thirst or drown you, the internet can be of help or hindrance, it's how you use it, it's how you use it. Let me let me throw this uh, question out. I, I think I'm going to throw this out to Paul. We're going to switch gears just slightly. It's all related, of course. But what are I found this curious? What do you think the connections are, if any, between genius and mental illness? I mean, some of our greatest musical composers, as an example, including Beethoven, Schumann, Tchaikovsky, Rachmaninoff, were all said to suffer from depression. All of them genius. Where's the connection here, if any? Yeah, Paul. they're. There is an incredible connection on um, when you just you know trace the, the etymology of the words. So um, the word um, daimon actually means the inner spirit or like the voice that, you know that gives you guidance, and um, that word is related to the to the to, to genius, and um, as in and it, hmm. and that word is related to um, remember the old TV show um, Dream of Genie. Hmm. I dream of genie which is related to the voice, the inner voice and one's calling and one's vocation. All of etymologically, all of those are related. And the point is, is that 
if you honor, you know, that daimon, that inner voice, you'll find your genius, you'll find your voice, your calling, your vocation. But if you don't honor that inner voice, if you turn away and whatever story you're telling yourself, oh, I can't do that, I'm not good enough or whatever, that daimon, it consolates in a negative way and becomes a demon. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why that every artist, you know, in a way they're struggling with, they all have demons. And if they're able to alchemically transmute the energy of that, of that demon, of that daimonic, you know, in a constructive, in a creative way, then they're an accomplished artist and they can be seen as being a genius. But if they don't do that, you know, um, they can become mentally ill. And just one final thing, mm. um, Jung calls um, the, what is it, the um, creative, he, he calls the um, daimonic, the not not yet made real creative. That's, that's a paraphrase, but that's almost word for word um, what he said. And so the idea is, is that encoded in the daimon is the creative energy. But if you don't actually access that creative energy, it can kill you. Encoded in Watiko is the cure. Oh my gosh, do, do you both realize the common themes here? Everything we're talking about is coming down to some fundamental common thread. Do you yeah, think? You, uh, totally. No, it's yeah. exactly, I mean, that's the thing that all these, these wisdom, these spiritual traditions, they, they've developed their own symbol system, they have their own language, um, but what makes them um, this wisdom tradition uh, is the fact that they're pointing at, whether you call it the Archons or mm. Watiko, or there are all these different names and symbols, but it's like they're all pointing at the same thing because the thing about these darker energies, they have no power when we shed light on them. Mm -hmm. They own power because we're not looking at them. We're turning away, and that turning away, that is Watiko. In my book, I talk about that. Remember I said it's a, it's a blindness. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, is that when we actually have the recognition of how they operate both out in the world and inside of our minds, then it, it takes away their power and we empower ourselves mm -hmm. to be creative beings because the real solution to all of this stuff is to tap in to the creative spirit as it moves within us. Love it. And Jay, this is what I was kind of alluding to, to both of you, uh, both in my discussion on Conscious Commentary last week as well as today, that I see in some way an initiatory aspect to the suffering based on what Paul just said, that if we understand it for what it is, or at least even approach uh, uh, whatever, the, in this case, we're talking about mental illness from that perspective, it can be a tool for empowerment. And thus, we're transmuting one thing that's looked at as a malady into magic. Jay? Yeah, well, like uh, getting back to the uh, Aborigines in Australia, um, they have an initiation, which at first sounds kind of weird, but when you examine it carefully, you realize what this initiation is really doing, which is dispelling Wetico. And what it is is they take uh, a boy, it's mo mostly, uh, we don't know the female initiations from the Aborigines, we only know the male because um, the people that observe these were males and they're only allowed into the male initiations, so we don't really know what the female initiations are. But in the male initiations, the elders, no relatives involved now, will take a 12-year-old boy and they take him out into the desert and they have a circle of rocks and they put the boy in the circle of rocks and they tell him that he cannot leave that circle. If he leaves the circle over the next three days, he will be banned from the tribe forever. And so the boy's kind of confused, doesn't have any food, doesn't have any water, and he's sitting in the center of the circle. As night approaches, the men dress up as animals, and they, uh, they, they dress real scary, and they make sounds and noises, and they run close to the edge of the circle and run back, and literally scaring the pee out of this uh, boy. And this goes on for about two and a half days, and then at the end uh, of this ritual, they come and they grab, the, they take the boy and they feed him, and they take him into town. And there's a big, huge party, and um, the boy is just so relieved to be, you know, full of food and not scared, and that it creates a kind of a maturity. 
in in him. And so a lot of so what I'm saying is that a lot of times you have to use fear to dispel fear. And once you dispel fear and you realize there's really not much to really be afraid of in this world, mm-hmm. then they, the, the, the negative energies have like no power over you at all anymore. And uh, I think that's what we have to do. And, and that's why um, our society is constantly selling fear. Mm-hmm. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. And, yeah. and so, uh, you know, you turn on the TV. I, I don't watch TV. I'll go to a hotel when I'm traveling. I'll turn on the TV. I'll almost have a heart attack mm-hmm. watching what they're talking about. And I, I can't imagine, you know, a steady eight-hour-a-day diet of that stuff. Yeah. But it, it will definitely create fear. And um, what, what are we afraid of exactly? I mean, we're, co- we're conscious spirits that live forever. There's nothing to be afraid of. We're afraid of our own shadow. That just came to me. You know yeah. that you know that phrase that w- was used sort of euphemistically or, you know, you, oh, you're afraid of your own shadow. But in actuality, this just came to me. I think people are afraid of their own shadow or the shadow aspect of themselves that if they probe deep enough, huh, may even find some answers. There's something, there's something, I just had to throw that out there. And by the way, as far as news and my coming from <laughs> the mainstream of news, I was just saying to someone, I cannot believe I entered sports broadcasting in 1986. Now I'm really dating myself. We used to say, if it bleeds, it leads. But I was saying to Dan Rather, who I interviewed a while ago, these days, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't make the cut. <laughs> Get it? So it's not even the leading stories. It's a whole newscast. So we got something going on there, meaning... Yeah, they're selling fear, all right. They're selling fear, and in in uh, about that fear thing in the shadow that that you and Jay were just talking about, because that's really yeah, I go think ahead. Point, because the thing, uh, first off, like the Watiko virus, it feeds off of fear and it feeds off of polarization. You know, so if we think, oh, they have Watiko and I don't, well, that point of view, you're obviously under the thrall of Watiko. But but then the thing about the shadow. You know, one one way I think that's a really helpful way of understanding the shadow and how it operates in our world and through Watiko, because that's the psycholo- the the psychological like like dynamic that underlies Watiko is projecting the shadow outside of ourselves, and how that works is that so say you know I have a darker part um, and that I can't own, and so you know I split off from it, I project it out. But say you know like this way of understanding, say if you're in a dream in a night dream. And you project out a part of yourself. Well, then what is the dream but your own mind just reflected mm-hmm. back? So all of a sudden, you know, the, here's the dream. It, it will embody and reflect back this darker part, this shadowy part that you've split off. And all of a sudden there'll be a person or a group of people or a nation, whatever, who will embody that shadow that actually whose origin is within you. And as soon as they they show up in your dream, you all of a sudden have evidence. Oh, well, the evil and the shadow is out there outside mm. of me. So that entrenches you even more in that viewpoint that you're just filled with light and the darkness is out there. And so then you even more project and you and then of course they embody it even more and you have more you have more evidence. It confirms to you your point of view, ad infinitum. And then of course you try to destroy the mm. people who are embodying that darkness because what you're basically doing that's just a reflection of the initial process of splitting off and trying to destroy and get rid of your own darkness. <clears throat> and that's and that's a form of madness. And of course, the other person or people are probably doing the same thing to you. <laughs> and um, and the thing is, so in trying to destroy the evil out there, you actually become possessed by the very evil you're trying to destroy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's ego. Profound. I'm getting this pictorial, Paul, of the, the snake biting its tail in a just continuously moving in a circle. Listen, I, I, there's so much I want to get to, and it's, I get the, I'm loving this conversation. And I, and I hope that our audience will too. I think they will. I'm going to talk about Jung. Let's bring Carl Jung back into this because he obviously did a little bit of work on a little bit of uh, analysis. Let's just say on this, among other things, you know, we're talking about dream time, the collective unconscious, the psyche. One of the things he said is the psyche is still one of the most mysterious regions of experience. Here's a thought that came to mind, guys, and I want to get your weigh in on this. You know, you, Paul, you talk about the etymology of words. I also find that quite uh, an interesting approach to understanding language and the words that we speak. And, you know, in Jungian psychology, obviously, he made the term archetype very popular. Uh, it's defined as a collectively inherited idea, 
pattern of thought image that's universally present in individual psyches. But here's the thought that came to mind, the epiphany I had. Does arc type and arc on archetype, archon, carry a clue to the invasiveness of this within the collective and individual psyche. I mean, let me just throw this one more thing out, and then I want to have you both comment. As an adjective, arc denotes, among other things, not the first definition, but one of them, cunning, crafty, and sly. I'd love to get your thoughts on on that. Just one quick thing I can say about that, like the archon, one of, one of the, the translations of the word is like the somebody who's like this governor or like a ruler yeah, right. and the archetype or like there, the, it's like sort of the underlying template, which rules our perceptions. So in a certain way, and of course that's also related to Watiko, which to the extent <clears throat> it's not seen, it commandeers the executive function of our psyche. And, you know, and, and all of the healthy aspects of the psyche unknowingly begin to serve it. So there's something about the idea of like, you know, who's in charge because that's basically, you see, the thing, I just want, I guess one final thing I want to say about Watiko and Archons is that they themselves have no creativity mm. program, but they plug into our creativity, our genius for how we actually co-create reality in such a way that it, they turn it against ourselves. Like what I was just saying with the, with the shadow projection, it's like, yeah, we have this unbelievable creative power in us, but to the extent we're unconscious of it, these energies plug in and turn it against ourselves in such a way that we destroy ourselves. Mm-hmm. So actually underlying the whole thing with addictions or, you know, trauma where we're, you know, continually repeating the, the whole way we're trying to heal the trauma is actually creating the very trauma we're trying to heal from in an infinitely self-perpetuating feedback mm-hmm. loop. Exactly. And that you forever until seen through. So the idea, the cure for any of this is to actually see, actually to recognize what's actually happening, to shed light on the covert operations of the darkness, hmm. and then it has no power. Right. Yeah. Jay, your thoughts on archetype, archon. The, the, do you understand what, what context I'm bringing this up in, in terms of words, understanding, huh, there's, there's some connection there. Oftentimes, this universal archetype represents itself as monstrous, particularly in the dream state. Arc on. Uh, you know, of which has many their iterations, n- different names. But thoughts on that, and then let's let's move into more of that. W- who are the archons? Yeah, you've talked about this so much, and I know our audience probably knows, generally speaking. But let's let's bring that demonic aspect into this. We must, Jay. Yeah. So the archons are first mentioned, of course, in the Nag Hammadi uh, texts, which were discovered in uh, Egypt in 1949, I think, mm-hmm. <clears throat> maybe 47, I can't remember, no, 45. And uh, they were translated, and the um, uh, people who uh, wrote these uh, texts down were, were called Gnostics, and uh, they were a religion that's been wiped off the face of the earth. Um, and there, if, if you go take a, a religious comparative religion class in college, well, at least when I went to college, mm-hmm. you will never hear mention of the Gnostics at all. Right. Um, they've been completely wiped out, and there's small sects still in Iraq, I think. But other than that, but the Gnostics believed that um, that there was a spiritual parasite called archons. Now, archon, as Paul said, it comes from uh, in Greek, it means rulers, and um, uh, and 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 again, um, the texts always warn. These ancient texts always warn that our rulers seem to be taken over by this evil force. And if you read history, you have no, uh, no other conclusion but that there does seem to be some kind of evil force making our rulers, our kings, our politicians a little bit crazy. Now, the um, Gnostics thought that the Archons were an external force that came into our world from extraterrestrial, actually. Mm -hmm. They actually say that it came from another planet and came here, and it's a spiritual infection that started about 3600 B.C., uh, according to the Gnostics, and it just gets, according to them, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. And the, uh, uh, what's interesting also is that these texts, the Nagamati, they describe what the archons are, or at least how you can tell when someone's infected by the archons. And I, when I was reading this, I happened to just also be reading 
uh, Snakes and Suits by uh, Dr. Uh, Hare, who's a, a, a psychologist and talking about psychopaths, and I realized that the Gnostic texts describing archons and the modern-day psychoanalysis of psychopaths uh, reveals the same exact personality traits. You know, a person that doesn't care about anybody, only thinks about themselves, uh, has no creative ability, just like Paul said. That's another thing that's very interesting, is that the people infected with these archonic forces are very, very jealous of creative people, mm. and they try to destroy them. And it's something that creative people cannot understand. They, oh, I, 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 I'm a creative person. I just want to, you know, donate my creative uh, abilities to the world. Yet the world doesn't want it, and they are constantly, you know, trying to beat me up uh, for it and calling and, and casting me down. And that's because these archonic forces can't be creative, so they hate creative mm. people. So that's another way you can tell them if, if, wow. if you're getting a, a load of crap every time you walk out there and everybody knows that you're very creative, that's probably why. And so, you know, creative people tend to um, isolate themselves uh, after a while in their life because mm. they realize that they're not getting a whole lot of encouragement from people around them, and they're not. And it's one of the problems that, that you know, people say, oh, I want to be an artist. I'm like, do you really want to mm -hmm. be an artist? Because you have no Narciss idea how Narciss difficult it is. About that, Jay, what you're saying, because it's such a great point, if I may. The idea, yeah, these forces don't have, uh, you know, they're not, they, they can't be creative, but they're incredibly good at imitating. Mm. And, what they, yeah. and what they do in the Bible, in the apocryphal text, they'll talk about this counterfeiting spirit. So these archonic forces, or what Tico, they will ape us. They'll, they'll actually impersonate, you know, do this, this, mimicry of us but it but and then if we're not awake in that moment we'll identify with their version mm -hmm. of who thinking that it's just who we are and then we've unwittingly given ourselves away we've identified with who we're not and we've become an instrument unwittingly for these higher dimensional negative forces good point yeah I, um i um i forget to forget the movie now nicole kidman played a psychopath in a movie now I can't she was a news reporter she had an affair with a young boy in the movie and it was a pretty uh, bizarre movie but she was asking the director before the shoot she said I don't get this character but please explain this character to me and he said to her okay so you're walking down the street and there's this really violent car crash and some people are seriously hurt in the car and everybody's running over to take care, you know, help them. He says, but you don't. You walk up to the car crash and you look down at the people as they're suffering. And then you go home and you look in the mirror and you try to mimic their suffering. That mm -hmm. is a psychopath. And uh, they do. They watch you. They watch what you're doing. They watch your movements. They try to imitate your facial expressions. They try to imitate the way that you speak. They're trying to get into you. And um, I've had mm. some very harrowing experiences with psychopaths and got very up close with them. And I can tell you that they're charming and mm. um, everything. But in the end, they're just imitating you in right. every way they can. And what you're saying that's so important, and I'm just saying, and that's a reflection of how the Watiko virus inside of our mind works, that same sense of studying us and imitating us and aping us and then presenting to us, like in any given thought form, like, oh, this is who you are, you know, in the limited version, um, and you, if you're not awake in that moment, you know, in a sense, they put us on. And putting us on has a double meaning of they fool us, but they put us on like a suit of clothes, and then if we're not awake, we then, you know, we identify with that version of ourselves mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, then we've disconnected from our true nature. Wow. Yeah. This is something. Listen, I'm looking at the time. We only have about 15 minutes left and we still have something to get to. I want to play a clip for both of you, uh, as well as our audience, of course, that has to do with uh, a show that I'd done back in 2016 with a woman named Diane Bischoff James. You can all, I'll link that uh, interview as well. Uh, Diane's a wonderful and talented author and speaker, uh, but the focus of her work is not at all in this area that I call high strangeness, the stuff that we dare to tackle. She's more, more of a motivational coach, inspirational teacher on manifestation, et cetera, very good at what she does. But she shared a story with me, guys, uh, actually, while we were out in the San Francisco area quite a few years ago at a conference. 
that stood me on my ear. And it's relevant to what we're talking about now. So I want you to listen to this clip and then I'd like to get both of your way in. So stand by folks, we're gonna play this clip. We'll be right back. I actually wanna take a full 180 degree turn because you know, Diane has a lot of stories that she's shared with me that she hasn't shared with others. And I, Diane, you know where I'm going with this. This is a story that you told me when we initially met, uh, I can't believe, it seems like it's been longer, but only two years ago in San Mateo, California for, I think it was the New Life Expo conference. And you told me this story. I've been bugging you ever since to let me record this uh, for my own work and research of, let's just call it the aspect that I call the field of high strangeness. You know what I'm talking about? So I don't know how or if we can tie this into what we've been talking about today. Maybe we can. Let's see if we can. But first, can you share the story with us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And and this is where it's nice to have you, Alexis, I uh, you know, you know a lot of the stories that don't always make it into print. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, I, I like so I'm to blowing up, up your spot. <laughs> no, I like to bring it up because um, I saw something that I was, you know, it wasn't until I had this experience that I really, um, I'm open to everything on spirituality. I'm open to everything metaphysical. I'm open to everything in the in this plane of existence. But it wasn't until I had this experience that it really. Um, confirm that there really is as much as there is a lightness there also is a darkness and that that's the part that was interesting to me um i had an uh one of my relationships when i was single um was with a person who had a very 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 strong active addiction and uh, it's one of the favorite stories in the book but um he he took me from this place of lightness and manifestation and positivity and growth to looking at the darkness of life that i've never ever seen before it involved everything from you know, getting arrested. Um, he was incarcerated. He um, he had hmm. he had things happening to his body that were just horrible, and it was all because of his addiction and because of all the 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 terrible things that went along with that addiction. But once um, he went to his mother's house, and his family was um, had a very strange dynamic. The mother was very strong, very controlling, and they too probably were participating in in other addictions. But he went out to go fix something, and uh, he was in the backyard, and his mom made him come back and said, "You've got to fix our telephone." system so he tried he went out he was an electrical engineer he actually had Mm. multiple masters Mm. he was brilliant and he came back in and i was out there with him in the yard and i said are you an electrician are you a telephone guy and he goes no and i said then how are you going to fix this he's like i don't know but my mom said i had to and i'm this is a 44 year old man i'm like Mm. okay well i sat there watching him for a while and then we we came in back into the kitchen and he goes mom um and she was just sitting there and it was kind of like Back, dark room, dark kitchen. It was almost, you know, five or six and it was going, getting to be dark outside. And she had one light over her head and she snapped her head and she looked at him and she goes, how dare you? And I swear her entire face turned gray. Her eyes turned black. I saw blackness in the center of her eyes and it was as if her skin turned a color, like the color of death. It's the only color I can think to describe it. It's like that sallowy, whitish gray color. And it was as if, weirdly, like she was possessed almost by an entity, a creature, a serpent. I don't know what it was. And I just stared at her because I'd walked in the door. He looked at her. I looked at her. And then in less than, you know, like another couple seconds, it all went back to looking like this older woman who was very sick and had like a lot of veins on her face. So kind of the blood came back. And I I just stood there in the doorway and I thought, I think I've just seen something that's not of this world. Yeah, there's the story. And, and just as a footnote, sadly, Diane then told me that this person, which was her boyfriend at the time, eventually committed suicide. So sad and so indicative uh, of what we're hearing is going on with increasing numbers. But what did we just hear, guys? Is this part and parcel of the archonic influence? What is going on? Yeah, I, if, if I could say something, or, or Jay, do you wanna you wanna go first? Go for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I I recognize that, and mm-hmm. that's we're talking about the you know the archetypes or um, um, daimonic energies. Well, daimonic energies or archetypal energies can literally possess like a, you know any any of us, and so they're higher dimensional energies that when somebody gets taken over, they literally 
by being possessed, they get taken over by this energy. They become the instrument for this mm. more powerful energy than just the egoic energy. It's a transpersonal energy. It's beyond the personal. And then they become the conduit for this energy. And if it's not done with consciousness, then it's going to be enacted unconsciously, which guarantees it's going to be destructive. So it sounds like what what she saw in, in her boyfriend's mother was she actually, because I'm so familiar with that with my mm. father, I, mm. I actually wrote a book about it, is that, yes, yeah, she literally saw this like demonic energy for that instant come over and you know take over a person and act itself out into the third dimensional world of space and time. Wow. Jay, what do you have to say? Well, I too have witnessed such a thing, and um, I have to say I was uh, completely perplexed by uh, what I saw. I was um, uh, on a job, a shoot, and I corrected someone who was uh, way out of their um, way out of their department. They were trying to tell somebody in another department what to do, and I was the director. And I walked up and I, you know, I said, "Hey, you know, you can't do that." You know, you just stick with your job, right? Don't do that. I was very nice. But this person, I swear to God, her face turned in for just a brief moment into a serpentine-like face. Even the, even the um, shape of the bones in the face seemed for just a second to actually morph and, and started sloping backwards. And her eyes took on this snake-like quality. And I tell you, uh, my heart just like about leaped through my chest when I saw it. And um, I, I got rid of her like the next day. I fired her because I, I realized I had something very horrifying, you know, in my midst. And uh, so, yeah, I've seen that. I've, I don't know what to make of it. Um, I could not imitate what I saw in the mirror. I tried. So do you I could think, not imitate it. Do you think, Jay, that these individuals, when they're, <laughs> we've, we've heard the, the shape-shifting uh, phenomenon before, and I really do think there may be something to it, do you think that they're aware, the, 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 the other aspect, the alter ego of them is aware, or the normal, quote-unquote normal part of them is aware that when this is happening? I don't think so. No. Yeah, and I, I, I would agree with that. Like when, when it used to happen with my father, there were times, you know, maybe an hour or two later when he came out of the state, I would talk to him about what had happened and he would have no memory. It was huh. as if he wasn't there, as if he left right. and some other energy or spirit had entered his vehicle and was operating through it. And then he came when he came back, you know, he had no awareness to, to whatever. Yeah. Interesting. This reminds me. I, I agree. Of, yeah. It's, oh my gosh. So fascinating. This reminds me just very briefly of my grandmother, who I don't believe was evil at all. In fact, this has nothing to do with it. But just when you go into an altered state of any kind, how somehow that uh, uh, conscious part of you moves to the side. They say that when, you know, sitting channels, it's a similar thing. But my, my grandmother, ever so often, when particularly what would trigger her is when she would hear like bad news. I remember once we were, uh, my mother had just got a call from a relative who told us that another relative had just passed away. And when my grandmother got the news, she started speaking in tongues. I have, mm -hmm. it's the only time I've seen it. My mother would tell me, your grandmother, I, I can count on one hand the times that she's done it. But when she did, and I remember it, I was, I don't know how old I was, maybe not even, I was still probably a teenager. When she came out of the state, now you can only imagine as a teenager, I'm just like frozen. But when she came out of the state, I said, or when she finished, I said, Granny, what did you just say? And she said, what are you talking about? She had no idea whatsoever. And I'm not saying it was a bad thing. It has nothing to do with that. But we have the ability to literally leave ourselves and something else is taking taking us over. Right. And wow. It's that place where if we actually can channel that in a constructive way, mm. we are it to express our creative spirit. That's sublime. That's incredible. That's where the greatest art is made. But if it's coming through, you know, us in an unconscious way, pretty much you, you can guarantee it's going to either be self or other, um, you know, create destruction, really. Mm. Well, and I, there's also the there's also the flip side. If you can if you can um, be possessed by such an evil spirit that it actually transforms the way you look, then can't you be 
possessed by a, a good spirit mm. that also transforms you. Love it. And so, I mean, you know, these things cut both ways. Absolutely. Oh, that's p- perfect uh, segue. You, you were reading off of my little notes here, Jay, because the next question I was going to ask is, you know, we, none of this is happening in a vacuum. This is not just a flaw in the human genome. This is an invasion of sorts. So the question becomes, how, if at all, can one begin to tackle this incredible malady? And I think you just brought up one one idea, Jay. Can we heal this once and for all, if not collectively, then certainly individually? Yeah, I mean, um, Alex Gray once said to me that, you know, he, he, he'd watched the movie The Exorcist. And as he was coming out of the theater, he was thinking about how, how art could be used to, you know, scare the living crap out of you. And then he thought to himself, well, why can't art then be used for creating a huge positive field? And that's when he decided to start his paintings that he was doing, that he has done his whole life. And so I think that's what I really believe that is what art is. It's to um, beautify the world with truth. And um, so there's lousy art and there's good art. But for uh, uh, you know artists like Da Vinci or Beethoven, you know they they were consciously trying to make the world a better place with their art, and I think that that that's kind of what we have to do today. Mm. We have to be mature and realize that we can influence this world. We have a huge influence on this world, and once we recognize the darkness, then we can dispel the darkness. But if you don't recognize it, it's just going to sit there and fester. Beautifully said. I cannot think of a better way to end this conversation, guys. We are out of time. Thank you for that, Jay. Paul, Paul let's, I want to get to you. we got a couple of plugs here. I'm delighted to say that you'll be joining us for another chat, Paul Levy, uh, coming up. Uh, we're going to schedule that uh, shortly to talk about your brand new book, which just arrived at my doorstep a few days ago, called The Quantum Revelation, A Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality. In the few minutes we have left, give us a, a quick taste of what this is all about. The quantum revelation. Yeah, sure. Well, it's funny because in in this context of, of our conversation, um, quantum physics is you know is the cure for Watiko. I mean, what it's actually discovered, and just in in essence, you know, it's proven that there's no objective world out there that through the observer effect, the act of us observing, we're actually invoking the world. You know, we're influencing the very world that we're observing. You know, the observer, the observed, and the act of observation are inseparable parts of one quantum system. And so that's pointing at that we, that the act of observation is actually creative. And what happened in pre-quantum physics is that people thought the world was objective. And then because that's the way they saw it, the world being a reflection would just manifest as if it was subjective, so they were literally in, entrancing themselves by the by the genius for creating reality that's inherent in our mind. And so quantum physics is like shedding light on that process. And in the same way with what Tico will project onto the inkblot of the waking dream and think it's at, it's outside of us, objective, and react to it and become conditioned through that process, quantum physics is shedding light on that and saying, wait a second, we actually have a hand moment Mm. by moment in creating our experience of ourselves and of the world. And so, you know, in the book, I go into that that, and I talk about what Tico. I say this is actually the cure for what Tico, what quantum physics has discovered. Mm. Love it. I can't wait to get get my hands into that book. I'm going to put it on my summer reading list soon because we want to have you back on. Thanks for that. Now, Jay, I know you've always got your plate full. You're a hard dude to catch up with, uh, not the least of which is the great work you're doing over at Gaia. So talk about that a little bit and tell us uh, what else is going on and what we need to be watching out from you for from you. <laughs> I have a lot going on. Um I have uh, a new show, which I'm going to announce uh, mm. soon, uh, appearing on Gaia, and um, I'm producing a lot of great stuff. Paul, I think I'd like to interview you when you come out here you know, about quantum physics and the cure for all of this, because I really mm-hmm. think you're onto something there. Um, so, yeah, I would love to. Um, I'll, I'll contact you, you know, later about this. But, yeah, I have a lot going on. I'm also in the pre-production for Q- Kubrick's Odyssey number 3, oh, which is the final of the trilogy, which will really explain what Kubrick was really saying in his films. And uh, I know everybody will be looking forward for that one. Beautiful. 
that. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. great. We're making deals right here in front of the Higher Journeys audience. Well, good. I think, <laughs> and I'll just let me know. One can one caveat: you got to let me know when it comes on, so I can <laughs> I can watch it myself. Right. Listen, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Don't hang up because I want I'm going to share something with with you briefly before we hang up. But I'm going to at this moment say thanks to our Higher Journeys audience for joining us. As always, we appreciate you a ton, and of course, Paul and Jay. Awesome conversation. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you so much, really.